Today we're going to continue this chapter on reactions and aqueous solution by talking about the first type of reaction we'll encounter in this chapter, uh, which is precipitation reactions. Let's go over a quick list of the learning objectives in this chapter. Uh, we're going to start with a quick unit overview. I want to make sure that we stay grounded in what the purpose of this unit is. It's a continuation of what we did with reactions and stoichiometry, and it's just dealing with new types of reactions that happen in solutions. Uh, we'll then talk about the actual precipitation reaction itself. We'll define it by in the beginning, and then we'll get into the idea of predicting products. You should be able to look at these reactions and figure out in advance uh, what type of products they'll be creating. Uh, finally, We'll end this process by talking about something new known as the net ionic equation. It's basically an abbreviated way of writing chemical reactions that shows only the relevant chemicals that are involved in the reaction as, to as opposed to other parts of the reaction we'll refer to as spectators or spectator ions. As I already said, let's begin with a quick overview of the unit itself. The unit is about reactions in aqueous solution, meaning reactions dissolved, reactions dissolved in water. Just remind you what that word aqueous means. Um, we have three types we're going to be tackling in this chapter. Precipitation reactions. These are reactions that create solids, and that's what the word precipitate means, to create a solid. We'll then move on to talk about acid and base reactions. Uh, we've only kind of very tentatively defined what an acid is and what a base is. Obviously, we'll improve that definition in the near future. But these are basically reactions that create water uh, when done in solution. And then finally, we'll talk about something very mysterious, something very different than stuff you've seen in the past, which is known as a redox reaction or a reduction oxidation reaction. And these reactions where electrons are exchanged, and that exchange of electrons uh, causes the reaction to occur, and it also causes uh, metals, typically, uh, to behave in some very interesting ways. As we mentioned already in the video, though, today's focus is right here on precipitation reactions. So let's start with the definition of what a precipitation reaction really is. It's a chemical reaction that creates a solid from two aqueous solutions. So we get a new chemical product, and we can identify it because it's a solid. And that means from two solutions, aqueous means, again, dissolved in water. And these solutions, it's funny, as a, a chemist who's been doing this for a long period of time, I don't find them very uh, fascinating, but I find when students see these happen for the first couple of times, they're pretty shocked and awed. Uh, it, it's some of that chemistry that seems a little bit like magic. You have these two things that look like water, you pour them together, and all of a sudden you get this big cloud of something new forming. These precipitation reactions are actually simply double replacement reactions, reactions where you have two ionic compounds switching partners, and we discussed this concept earlier in the year. What's really going on here is you have two soluble ionic compounds, those are your two solutions, and they combine then to create a new ionic compound, something that wasn't there before, and this new ionic compound is not soluble in water. And as a result, this new ionic compound, what we call crashes out of solution, and we get that solid or that precipitate formed. Now let's take a minute and remember what a double replacement reaction is all about. If you look back to your uh, reaction types worksheet, this is what we have listed there. And in a double re uh, replacement reaction, the real key term here is the idea of switching partners. If we recall, an ionic compound is held together by opposite charges, positive and negative, and this guy over here, positive and negative. In a double replacement reaction, the either negative or positive partners switch places. So A was paired with B. At the end, now A is paired with D. It's still a combination of pluses and minuses, so everything still works out. Uh, and as a result, we get a new ionic compound here and a new ionic compound here. But again, the real key term here is the idea of switching partners. Now let's start tying this idea of a double replacement reaction into some of the concepts we've already talked about in this unit. Uh, recall, when ionic compounds dissolve into water, they separate into ions. And we had a word for this. These guys are electrolytes. So when they dissolve in water, they separate into uh, separate ions. Here's two examples. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound, therefore it's an electrolyte. When it dissolves in water, we get sodium ions and chlorine ions separately. And if you recall, each one of these gets encapsulated by its own shell of water molecules, and that's what creates the solution. That was a process of solvation. Same thing happens down here. We have magnesium chloride, and you get this new uh, breakdown that gets separated into ions. But in this case, since it was MgCl2, we end up getting two chlorines. But the process is the same. All of these guys would be encapsulated with water molecules, and we would have our solution. Uh, 
So again, the real thing to remember here is that they separate into ions when dissolved into water. The reason double replacement reactions can occur is when you have your AB salt and your CD salt in solution, it's not really AB and CD, it's just a bunch of A ions and B ions and C ions and D ions just floating around. We can think of this reaction as looking something a little bit more like this. When these guys are actually in solution, this is really what we have here. It's just the loose ions each encapsulated by its sphere of water molecules. We don't really expect to see the compound AB and we don't expect to see the compound CD unless one of the two of these is a weak electrolyte. But for now we're going to assume everything's strong which means everything separates into its individual ions. So that actually brings us to an interesting point. In most double replacement reactions nothing interesting really happens. You've got the AB ions in solution, you've got the C and D ions in solution and they're all floating around. There might be a moment where an A and a D comes together, but if those things are soluble, they just separate apart again and nothing new and interesting happens. You simply have two solutions mixed together in the same container, making like a super solution of some sort. So as long as those, all those ions stay in solution, nothing has really happened except they're now all in the same container. So what happens in an actual precipitation reaction? Well, in a precipitation reaction, when all those ions are jumbled around and combining and breaking apart with one another, one of the combinations is capable of creating a solid. It's something that all of a sudden is not soluble in water, which means the ions don't all stay in solution. So again, we can have that AB, which is an aqueous solution, which means it dissolves in water, reacting with CD, which means it's an aqueous solution, it means it's dissolving in water, uh, and all of those things are floating around, the A ions, the B ions, the C ions, and the D ions, but all of a sudden when certain ions combine with one another, they create something new. They create all of a sudden an ionic compound that is no longer water soluble. This little S here again means it's a solid, which means this stuff comes out of solution, which means the A ion and the D ion is no longer available to kind of slosh around a little bit. We're still left over with the, uh, the leftover bits, the pieces that stay in solution, but the key thing here is that we've made something new. We've made a solid that doesn't dissolve in water. I think you can see this a little bit more clearly when we write the solution or uh, the ions as being separated as opposed to together. Uh, for example, here's our AB compound aqueous. That really means we have a solution full of A ions and B ions. And we write CD aqueous, which really means we have C ions and D ions floating in solution. Everybody's on their own. Everybody's encapsulated by their bubble of water. Now, as time goes by, A's are going to bump into B's, and they'll make AB for a fraction of a second, and it'll fall apart. And B's are going to bump into D's, and they'll make a compound for a second, and it'll fall apart. But every now and then, an A is going to bump into a D. And when an A bumps into a D, they're going to combine to create something new. They're going to create this AD. And just like before, you'll make the molecule for just a moment there, but in that moment, something else will happen. This molecule will come out of solution, and it'll make a solid particle. And as a result of that solid particle being formed, these guys can no longer go back into solution, which means that this is now permanent. Everything else can change around like it wants, but this is permanent. And notice again that compounds, the, the C ion and the B ion stay in solution, and as a result, we draw them up here as being that CB, but still being aqueous. But this is the real catch here. It's we've created something that no longer dissolves in water, which means that these ions can no longer interact with the rest of the system that is dissolved in the water. It's almost like they're in totally different worlds. So this idea then, this basic concept, allows us then to predict the products of a precipitation reaction. We should be able to look at the reagents we have, the chemicals we start with, and decide in advance what type of products we would expect to form uh, by using our solubility rules. If we can find a combination of positive and negative ions of the things we have available from our reactants, then that's not soluble, then that substance should come out as a precipitate from our reaction. Again, it's any combination of a positive and negative ion. Before we go any further, I think it's important you take a minute, pause the video, go find the solubility rules you should have already printed out from previous videos and get those ready. Uh, we're going to need them in order to discuss the combinations and find something that is or is not insoluble. Hopefully now you have your solub solubility rules in hand. Uh, here's an example of the type of question you'll be able to be asked to tackle here. Will a reaction occur, meaning will we create a precipitate, by combining uh, solutions of silver nitrate and sodium chloride? And this is actually a reaction that you guys have done earlier in the year. So first things first, when I'm handling problems like this, I like to write out the reaction as it's been explained to me so far. Now this takes a little of your naming skills, uh, but silver nitrate 
looks like this guy, AgNO3, the silver ion and the nitrate ion, and sodium chloride is hopefully one that we're both uh, we're familiar with. If you check your solubility rules, both silver nitrate and sodium chloride are soluble in water, um, so that's why we describe these as being aqueous. Now, when you have these two ions, they sep or these two compounds, they separate into silver ions, they separate into nitrate ions, they separate into sodium ions, and they separate into chlorine ions. So these are all the ions we're going to get in solution when we have this solution and our sodium chloride solution. Now originally they're separate. This is in one beaker, this is in another, and then we dump them together. And as a result of dumping them together, everybody can interact with everybody now. Well that means the silver can combine with the nitrate again. We already know that that's insoluble. Or the silver can now combine with the chlorine ions because now the chlorine ions are available and it's a positive negative combination. Likewise our sodium ions can combine again with our chlorines and our sodium ions can combine now because they're mixed with our nitrates. So these are the, all the possible combinations. We have four combinations of positive and negative ions. The question is, is, does any of these combinations create something that is not soluble in water? If it does, we'll get a precipitate and that soluble formed a reaction will have happened. If we don't, then nothing happens. Everything stays in solution. They all stay as separate ions floating around, and this ends up being a very boring day in the lab. We've got to check your solubility rules, and we'll take a look at these. If you take a look at your solubility rules, we can take a look at them by negative ion typically. Uh, we'll start with the chloride ion here. Uh, chlorine ions, if you look on your list, are one of the halides, and they are pretty much soluble with anything, and sodium certainly isn't one of the exceptions. So this won't create a, uh, a precipitate. And sodium nitrate, uh, NO3, again, nitrates are soluble with pretty much everything, and sodium isn't uh, an exception. Therefore, this will not create a precipitate. So as of now, no reactions has occurred, and this has ended up being very boring. We go over here again. We look up nitrates on our sheet. We just commented over here that nitrates are pretty much soluble with everything, and silver is not an exception. So this won't create a precipitate. And we take our last option here is the silver and the chloride. Well, just like we said, chlorides are typically very soluble with almost anything except when they're combined with silver. Silver chloride is something on our list as being insoluble, so we would expect this reaction to create AgCl, which is a solid, it is insoluble in water, plus the sodium nitrate, which will remain aqueous in solution, which means we'll have all this other stuff floating around in solution. The only thing we really create in this process is this new compound, this silver chloride. So this would be a precipitation reaction, and we would see a reaction form here. We created silver chloride. Let's try another one of these. In this situation, will a reaction occur? Will we create a precipitate by combining solutions of sodium sulfate and iron chloride? Uh, as always, we need to write a reaction first. We'll get something that looks like this, Na2SO4, which is our sodium sulfate, and FeCl3, which is our iron 3 chloride, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to map out the possible combinations and then decide if any of them represents something that will create a precipitate. So we got sodium as our positive ion. That can combine, when combined, with the sulfate, and it can combine with the chloride ions. Any negative ion it can combine with because it's a positive ion. Our other positive ion available is iron, and it can combine with the sulfate, SO4-2, negative or it can combine again with the chlorine. And these are our four possible combinations. If you haven't already figured it out, there will always be four combinations. The question is, is are any of these um, insoluble in water? Will any of these combinations create a precipitate? Well, we do it one at a time again. We look up the list of sulfates. Sulfates generally are considered soluble with a couple exceptions. Iron is not one of those exceptions. If you're confused as to where I'm getting this information from, it's my solubility um, rules chart. If you don't have it in front of you, get it out. Again, chlorides typically are very, very soluble. Uh, there's a couple exceptions, but iron's not one of them again. So as a result, this is not going to create a precipitate either. We continue. As we've already said, sulfates are very soluble in water, a couple exceptions, but sodium isn't one of them, so this will stay in solution. And then finally, it can combine with chloride. Again, chlorides are generally soluble, except for a couple exceptions, and sodium is not one of them. As a result, none of these guys create a precipitate, so we would say here that no reaction 
has really occurred. We haven't created anything new. All we've created, we've gone from sodium ions, sulfate ions, iron ions, and chlorine ions in solution to a new solution that contains sodium ions, sulfate ions, iron ions, and chloride ions. You can imagine that they've been jumbled around a little bit. But we haven't created a substance that is distinct or different from the two chemicals we started with. And that's what chemical reactions are all about, creating new chemical substances. So you would say in this case, no reaction. Now, if this is a little bit mysterious still, I wouldn't be too worried yet. This is definitely something we'll work on and discuss in class, and I encourage you to bring some questions uh, to clear up this idea. It's not a hard thing to do, but it might be a little tricky to wrap your head around in the beginning. Now, let's wrap this process up by talking about a new way of writing chemical reactions that shows this precipitation process and gets rid of all the unnecessary information we don't need. This is something known as a net ionic equation. Uh, this is basically a chemical reaction that only shows the ions involved in the chemical process of creating the precipitate. As we've seen in our previous examples, there are always other ions around, but those other ions start out in solution and then they end up in solution at the end, which means they don't do all that much. And those are not ions we're necessarily interested in. We want to focus on the ones that create the precipitate. So again, we can look at one of the examples we had from before. This is a precipitation reaction. We know that because it creates a solid over here. Uh, and then again, everything else stays in solution. Now we're going to define something new here, something known as what's called a spectator ion. Now if you think about a spectator in a sports event or in a, a production of some sort, a spectator is a passive has passive involvement, which means they're there to watch, but they're not there to do anything. You don't expect people in the audience of a play to step up on the stage and start acting. You expect them to sit in their seats, watch the show, and leave when everything's are done. Same thing's going on here. Spectator ions are ions in the chemical container, meaning they're involved in the process, that are not involved in creating of the new product, are not involved in creating of the precipitate. In this case, our precipitate is silver chloride, which means the silver ions are involved, the chloride ions are involved, but the nitrate and the sodium are not. The nitrate and the sodium are what we would describe as spectator ions. They have to be there. They're the person that brings the silver ion, and they're the person that brings the chloride ion along with them, because every ion needs a pair. But in the actual reaction itself, it's not something that's actually important to the process. As a result, these spectator ions still end up in the reaction, the whole reaction, but they end up here as the other thing that's aqueous, which means it's still dissolved in water, which means, again, these guys haven't done anything. So we're going to focus not on the spectators, but on the ions that are actually involved. This allows us then to write what's known as a net ionic equation. In a net ionic equation, we only show information relevant to the creating of the precipitate, and those spectators only serve as those opposite ions. So basically what we want to do is write a new chemical reaction with the spectator ions removed. So we're going to take out the nitrate, because we don't need that, it's a spectator, and we're going to take out the sodium because it's a spectator, and the reason we know they're spectators is because here they are at the end again, still dissolved in water. They haven't done anything new or special. This would still separate into sodium ions and nitrate ions, and they'd still be floating, floating around. This then would be the net ionic equation for our reaction. It shows just the ions involved. We've got silver plus, unpaired, aqueous, combining with chloride minus unpaired aqueous to create silver chloride. Now implied in this reaction is the fact that the pairing ion, the negative ion here, and the positive ion here must still be present, but we just don't care what they are. They can be anything as long as they bring the silver and chloride together so that it can make our precipitate, which is silver chloride. Just to drive this point home, I'm going to show you uh, how we can talk about the fact that those spectator ions really don't play a significant role in anything. Uh, again, here's our reaction as I said before. We already said that nitrate is a spectator and that sodium is a spectator, which means it's really only the silver and the chlorine that combine to create our silver chloride product. And this stuff, again, is all just ions still dissolved in solution, which means they're ions that aren't doing anything really useful. Now I can change this reaction a little bit to look like this. Notice I've paired my silver and my chlorine with something new, but it doesn't matter because the product is still the same stuff. It's still silver chloride solid, and the new ion here, this is our acetate ion, is still just along for the ride. It's bringing the silver with it. Likewise, the chlorine is now paired with a potassium, but who cares? It doesn't matter because the acetate and the potassium still just end up as aqueous solutions. They don't come out of solution, and they're just ions floating around. It's still the silver, 
reacting with the chlorine to create silver chloride. And regardless of which two of these reactions you performed, you'd still get the same new chemical product made. And in both cases, we would write the same net ionic equation to represent both of them. Because we're only interested in the chemical, the new substance that's formed in the process, which in this case is silver chloride. This idea can be a little abstract. I find students have a hard time letting go of the fact um, that certain ions are important and certain ions aren't. As always, this is something we will discuss and practice further in class, uh, and hopefully through that it'll be something that will be a little bit clearer.